Okay, uh, so let's get started. Now well, there's a smaller crowd for a normal Friday. Is there some holiday coming up that I don't know? Our climate needs us. What is that? Oh, okay, I see. That's important. It's outside? Okay, I see, okay. I actually empathize with that quite a bit, but uh, I didn't know it was right now. You want to join? <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, lots of people. Like, well, I think we can be with them in spirit, I think. I wasn't aware of that. That's fine. I think this lecture is recorded so people can watch it afterwards also. So if you want to go and join them, it's perfectly fine with me. Up to you. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's get started. Uh, this is nice also the, that they let us know. <laughs> and I agree with this actually. I think it's really important that we care about our climate. Sustainability is becoming very, becoming a key issue. Uh, and we need to think about that as, in whatever field we're in, we need to think about that. No question about that. Okay, uh, with that said, I'm going to talk about timing and verification. I thought it was, the, it was the fact that I said this topic is going to be hard and maybe boring <laughs> that led people uh, not to, uh, that, that prompted people not to come, but I, I'm very happy to hear that it's, the, it's that other thing over here. <laughs> okay, uh, so we're going to talk about timing and verification. Hopefully you've, read, you've done the readings. Uh, now we're going to cover them. Uh, and then next week, we're going to raise the abstraction level and we're going to really build uh, processors going forward in this course, and hopefully it'll be fun. We're going to start with the von Neumann model. Okay, but before I continue, uh, there's a talk announcement that I want to make. This may be interesting to some of you. It may be at a different, difficult level for some of you, but if you're interested in architectures for deep learning, deep neural networks, uh, uh, a colleague of mine, Matan Neres, who was a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, where I got my PhD from, is coming to give a talk on this exact same topic that he's doing research on. And we're going to advertise, advertise this talk in the mailing list also. So if you want to come, uh, it's next Friday. Oh, there's no date over there, but it's next Friday, not today. Uh, we'll make sure that's corrected at 4 after class uh, at CAB uh, G51. So feel free to come. If you want to send a review of the paper to me, feel free to send. A uh, review of the talk to me, feel free to send. Maybe I'll decide to give extra credit for you. Who knows? <laughs> it's good. I, I like initiative. So if you have initiative, you'll get extra credit. <laughs> OK, uh, you can read this later on. Basically, this, uh, this is the work on accelerating deep neural networks with hardware and algorithmic approaches together, which is a hot topic today. Uh, actually, I was reading yesterday about Facebook's hardware on accelerating AI. They call it AI acceleration, but essentially accelerating machine learning. Okay, what will we do today? We'll, we're going to cover a much more traditional topic, which is critically important in the design of all of the accelerators and everything, basically, which is essentially timing. How do you satisfy timing and how do you verify the circuits? So uh, basically, we're going to talk about timing and combinational circuits first. We're going to talk about propagation delay and contamination delay, which is essentially maximum delay in a combinational path and a minimum delay in a combinational path, and they're both very important. Maximum delay is more important, but minimum delay you need to satisfy also. We're going to talk about glitches, which may or may not be important. And then we're going to talk about timing and sequential circuits. What do you need to satisfy to ensure that your uh, value gets latched correctly? Uh, and we're going to talk about determining how fast a circuit can operate. And then we're going to move into circuit verification, which is also very important. How do you make sure a circuit works correctly at the functional or logical level? Functional and logical are the same and also at the timing level. We're not going to spend a lot of timing, uh, time on timing verification because it's a very much, much more difficult and detailed topic than uh, we're ready for at this moment. But functional verification that you're going to do a lot uh, in, in very long. OK, so I'll start with uh, high level trade-offs. Basically, circuit design is a trade-off between many things. Area, we've seen circuit area is prop proportional to the cost of the device. And we talked about minimizing area a little bit. But it's not just about area. It's also about speed, throughput, uh, speed uh, could be latency in terms of how fast you can operate the circuit. Throughput could be how many things you can do at the same time. Uh, that's bandwidth. We'll see more of that later. Uh, but I'm going to say these are basically performance together. We want faster in general. That's why AI uh, machine learning has been possible because we were able to build faster things. And now we want even, more, even faster because we have so much data to analyze in machine learning. Power and energy are important. Uh, Basically, many devices today have a limited power supply. Even 
even the biggest supercomputers are limited by power. Uh, and uh, we need to somehow t uh, keep it under control, especially because this is also important, as you can see, right, climate. So power and energy are critical. You can, of course, add more power, but then uh, there's a problem with it. Okay, and design time is also important, right? How, how long does it take to uh, start and finish the design uh, and get the hardware out at the end, a working hardware out at the end? Sometimes it takes years, four or five years, sometimes longer. Sometimes the design cycles are short, and the competition will not wait for you, right? You may be designing the biggest uh, AI accelerator of the world today. If you're late by three months, you basically make zero money and you're out of business because somebody else is also doing that, right? So this is also important. So it's really a trade-off between all of these, and ideally you want to achieve the best on all of those, but that may not be always true. You, you need, really need to find the niche that you have. Okay, and requirements and goals depend on the application. We know that, basically, if you're, if you're building a very uh, powerful device in your brain-computer interface, you don't want your brain to uh, start burning. That's probably, uh, yeah, and this, the, the requirement may be a little bit different over here, right? Okay, anyway, so circuit time. But, but it, actually, the processors that are built, that are, are used in all of these places, maybe not in your ear right now, but in the future, they may be, but this has a lot of processors, and there's a lot of radiation up there where this goes, and the radiation causes errors in the circuit, and you need to actually make the circuits resilient to those errors that uh, we're not exposed to as much over here. Okay, so we're gonna talk about circuit timing first. Uh, until now, uh, we've missed, uh, so we're not gonna talk about uh, radiation, for example, in this case. Uh, although it's a fascinating topic, there's, you, can, you can talk about reliability quite a bit. We're gonna focus on uh, timing. Until now, we've inves investigated logic functionality, right? We've talked about uh, logic elements as perfect devices with no timing. But timing is real. A circuit is not perfect in the sense that it, whenever its inputs change, its output doesn't immediately change. There's some timing associated with it. And we want to understand how fast we can make the circuits, how can, make it, how can we make them faster, and what happens if we actually run a circuit too fast? That actually could be a problem also. We'll, we're going to talk about it when we get to flip-flop the timing. So a design that's logically correct can still fail because of many real-world implementation issues. Timing is one of them. Uh, reliability is another. So we'll start with combinational circuits first. So abstraction we've had with digital logic is that output changes immediately with the input. Right? So basically you have this inverter, it's uh, beautiful, and you have this beautiful waveform. When you, whenever you change A uh, from one to zero, the output immediately reflects that. There is no delay. But unfortunately, that's not the reality. The reality is that these things have some delay associated with them. They're small, but uh, we're, at, we're at those small scales right now. Basically, outputs are delayed from inputs. Hopefully, this is obvious, right? Transistors take a finite amount of time to switch. Uh, and the wires are also uh, not perfect in the sense that they take a finite amount of time to propagate the voltage. Right? So basically, your waveform looks kind of like this. A changes. A doesn't immediately change, first of all. It takes some time for A to ramp up. And then this gets reflected into the output of the inverter sometime later. So there's some delay associated with this gate. So this is called the gate delay, actually, in this case. But if you actually look at uh, Y over here and Y somewhere later, there's also a delay in the propagation through the wire. So, okay, basically that's what we're going to deal with. How do we actually design things correctly uh, when they have non-zero uh, non delays? Okay, this is an example. This is from a particular paper that's referenced here. You don't need to read about it. You don't need to know about it. But this is a real waveform that people have measured on an inverter. This is the input signal. Clearly, it's not perfect, right? If it were perfect, it would go from zero to five volts over here, but it takes some time. And then it takes some time to go down. Uh, and as you can see, uh, while it's going down, the output signal is going up but it's, there's some delay. And these folks measure the delay as whatever nanoseconds. And the delay is not always the same, as you can see, depending on where you measure the delay, the delay is slightly different. Here they measure 0 0.169 nanoseconds, but this is real, basically. And this depends on, of course, uh, what kind of voltages do you use, what kind of elements do you use, what kind of process technology do you use, how small is your inverter, uh, et cetera, which we're not going to go into. They're very much below our level of abstraction. Again, if you take a microelectronics design course, you will learn a lot about all of those, and they're great to learn because it's really important and it's really fundamental, but that's not the subject of this course. Okay, so 
a delay is real, basically. Uh, it's fundamentally caused by the capacitance and the resistance in a circuit. Basically, every element has some capacitance and resistance, transistors, wires, uh, everything. Uh, and also, you have finite speed of light. Uh, this, we're actually getting close to it because at the nanosecond scale, we're operating things at the nanosecond and picosecond scale. Uh, electrons basically move at some uh, speed. Okay, and anything that, are effect that affects these two, uh, these two things, well, speed of light is hopefully not affected uh, by much, but anything that affects capacitance and resistance actually change the delay also. So delay is not constant. Even though we're going to treat it as constant right now, I would like to quickly say that that's not true. Uh, because actually the rising and falling inputs are, give you different delays, as you've seen in the inverter, very little. Uh, different inputs have different delays. Actually, this is going to be important for us. Uh, what we're not going to tackle is changes in environments can actually change the delays. So temperature, for example, at high temperature, uh, uh, electrons get scattered. As a result, delay is actually longer in general. Uh, and also aging of the circuit. If the circuit ages and for some reason it was uh, subject to uh, effects that actually wear it out, it may actually lose some electrons over the course of 10 years. And as a result, it may actually become slower over time. There is many evidence of that. But we're not going to talk about these environmental and aging type of effects. We're going to focus on the inputs and different delays. But I'm going to give you an example of this environmental effects and how important that is actually. So basically, you have a range of possible delays from input to output, uh, even if you don't have the environmental effects over here. So, okay, let me uh, give you some definitions. If you've done the readings, this is going to be easy. So there are two uh, definitions for the delay from input to output. One is the contamination delay. It's a big word, but basically it's used. It's the delay until the output starts changing. You assert the input, and it takes some time for output to start changing. That's the minimum delay, basically. And then there's a propagation delay, which is essentially the delay until the output finishes changing. And that's the maximum delay. OK, yes? Let, let me finish it, and if you still have the question, let's, let's get back. <laughs> because I, I haven't fully uh, given the uh, thing yet. So basically, maybe this will answer your question. <laughs> So basically, assume that we're, we're, we're dealing with combinational circuits right now. This is a combinational logic, as you've seen before. This is A and B. There are two inputs. And we're looking at output Y. Let's assume we're changing one input now. So this is A. You start changing A uh, to some level, either low to high or uh, high to low. And then it takes some time for, to y, for y to start changing. Uh, so the cross-hatching value means changing. The minimum time that's required for why to start changing is called this contamination delay. Make sense? From input to output. And the time that's required for why the output to settle to a value is called the propagation delay through the circuit. And that's also called the maximum delay. Make sense? So it takes some time to start changing. That's the minimum delay. So if things are not going to change, that's the minimum delay you still need to wait. And uh, if things are going to change, then you need to wait until uh, the end of the propagation delay. Because this is the safe time when you can actually use the output Y, because that's the maximum propagation delay through this combination logic. OK, we'll see why this contamination delay is important soon. Actually, both are important, but this, is, this propagation delay is really what determines how fast you can run your clock, as we will see later. OK, so basically, let's take a look at some examples. Uh, we'll calculate long and short paths. This is called a path through the circuit. There's a long path, which leads to TCD, contamination delay. And there's a, oh, sorry, there's a short path, which leads to this. And there's a long path, which leads to propagation delay. OK, we'll see why the shortest path matters and also longer path matters. So this is, let's, uh, I just cooked up the circuit, three gates. Uh, in this case, you have four inputs, one output. And the short path is basically whenever this input changes, right? That's the shortest path. It basically goes through this uh, delay of the AND gate. So it's really uh, the contamination delay of the AND gate. We're ignoring the wire delays over here. Ideally, actually, you should put the wire delay over there too, but I'm, I'm going to ignore the wire delays for now. So basically, uh, the, the fastest time this will start changing is whenever this arrives uh, over here. Uh, at, at the, uh, uh, yeah, basically, whenever this gets reflected and starts changing Y. The longest time it takes for this output to settle uh, to a good value is 
determined by how long it takes to propagate values of A and B or A or B through these three gates. Right? That takes three gate delays and basically two AND gate delays, two uh, propagation delay of the AND gates, plus the propagation delay of a single OR gate. And the longest path through a combinational logic circuit is called the critical path, because that determines whenever you can actually sample this output. This will become more clear when we actually combine this combinational logic with a sequential logic, because you want to do something with this output. One thing you really want to do is latch that output to a register at the end. So the clock cycle time of that sequential logic will be determined by this critical path through the circuit. Make sense? Among other things, there will be other things we will add to the equation. So it won't be as simple as just this critical path. But just remember that this is the longest delay over here now. Make sense? And it's called propagation delay. Yes? Um, is the longest path justified by the number of gates it has to pass? We'll see examples. It's not necessarily number, it's also the delay of the gates. Because the gates may be very slow, right? So you need to add up the delays. Okay. In this case, it's clear that the delays of these two plus this one is larger than the delay of just this one, right? Okay, unless you have negative delay, which doesn't happen. We would like that to happen, but that doesn't happen. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. This is a real example, actually. I don't know, how many of you have used this stuff? Okay, good. Where, in high school? Probably, okay. Uh, so basically, this is an example of circuit. Basically, it consists of four NAND gates. Right? And I'm not going to give you uh, the NAND gate delays, but this actually, uh, this is a data sheet, uh, which you can download, and look at the delay of the NAND gates over here. And it actually looks complex, as you can see, right? Why? Because it's dependent on the voltage you supply to the circuit, and it's dependent on the temperature. So this is the propagation delay. They give you the propagation delay. This is the maximum delay. Uh, and then if you look over here, uh, at high uh, voltage, you get uh, a seven picosecond delay, I think. I'm not sure. Where do they have that? Yeah, anyway, it could be, yeah, nanosecond, sorry, over here. It's not as fast. Seven nanosecond delay. But if your voltage is low and you're operating at 125 degrees Celsius as opposed to 25 degrees Celsius, the delay is 135 nanoseconds. That's a huge variance, right? So the delay is dependent on voltage and temperature also. Don't forget that. We're going to ignore this uh, for the rest of uh, the, the discussion. But this is really, really important. If you increase the temperature, reduce the voltage, your delays increase significantly. OK, so let's take a look at an example, worst case uh, a propagation delay. We're going to look at two different implementations of a 4 to 1 multiplexer, which we've seen before. And this answers your question over here. Basically, we're going to assume some propagation delays based on, let's say, data sheet values or based on your measurements that you've done, based on the implementations that you have for these gates. For example, a NOT gate has a propagation delay of 30 picoseconds. A 4 input OR has a propagation delay of 90 uh, picoseconds. I like picoseconds better because it's much faster than nanoseconds, right? I would prefer 10 to the minus 12 over 10 to the minus 9. OK, so this is one implementation, that the implementation that we saw of the uh, 4 to 1 MUX uh, in the past. If you look at the delay over here, there's a propagation delay from S to, uh, S to Y, uh, which is basically this blue path over here. Y is the output, S is the input. There's also a propagation flow, a delay from D to Y. Let's concern ourselves from S to Y. Basically, this S to Y goes through an inverter and an AND gate and a four input OR gate. That's a three input AND gate and a four input OR gate. If you add the delays up, you get 200 picoseconds. So, and if you look at D to Y, uh, basically assume that S is not changing, but D is changing, then the delay is an AND gate and an OR gate. So N3 plus OR4, 170 picoseconds. So your critical path is the longest path, which is S to Y. That's how you calculate your critical path. Basically, you enumerate all paths and then figure out which one is the longest. The tools that you are using are going to do that also. So is this the best way of designing this? Maybe not. So this is another design of the same multiplexer. It uses these tri-state buffers. If you design them well, they work well. If you don't design them well, they don't work well. But if you design them well, uh, assume that uh, the tri-state buffer has this sort of delay. Uh, A to Y, basically, in input to Y is 50. Enable to Y, enable signals, this one uh, is 30, uh, 35. So let's take a look at the S, input to output delay over here. You go through an inverter and an AND gate, and then go through the enable of this, and then output comes here. Basically, it takes 30 picoseconds here, 60 picoseconds here, and 35 picoseconds through the tri-state buffer, because 
uh, the time it takes over here is 35. And this, uh, this signal should have arrived earlier, hopefully. So it, it's 125 picoseconds. And if you actually look at the D to Y delay, it's only 50 picoseconds because once D is ready, it takes 50 picoseconds to go over here, assuming this is ready. So the critical path, it really goes through this part over here. As a result, different designs lead to significantly different delays. Ignore this one because this may not be as important right now, but the critical path is reduced from 200 picoseconds to 125 picoseconds by simply changing the kind of gates that you use because you know the properties of the gates, right? So this is a real example of how you can actually optimize your design to be much faster while being logically the same. Yes? Uh, much more gates. Uh, not necessarily, right? I'll let you think about that. <laughs> you may be using much more gates, but are you using more transistors? So this is a four input OR gate. So I haven't done the calculations. <laughs> it's not a two input OR gate. Four input OR gate will have a lot of transistors, right? So I think this, uh, I don't, and, and sometimes, actually, you may be right. Uh, it may not be true in this case, but you may be right. You may actually increase the area to reduce the latency. No question about that. There is a trade-off. But in this case, I'm not sure if that's a trade-off. Of course, the design of this may not be as easy, uh, the tri-state buffer. So there, there are clearly trade-offs, right? You're, you'll reduce latency, but the design of some of these may not be as easy. <laughs> OK? OK, oh, also, by the way, these are three input ends, and these are two input ends. So that also makes it, I think, I think this is definitely uh, smaller. So I, this is a better multiplexer design in general if you can do the tri-state tri buffers nicely. Okay. Okay, so uh, basically we've calculated a critical path delay for one example. Basically it's simple. Once you see the circuit, you can calculate the critical path delays. You need to find the longest path. Uh, of course, you need to know the gate delays. But it's not always easy to determine this if you have a complicated circuit. This is... Very simple, right? If you actually have, I don't know, 500 different uh, gates, it becomes more uh, difficult. Because not all the input transitions actually affect the output. And you can also have multiple different paths from an input to the output. So it's not going to be as easy. Uh, in reality, circuits are not built, uh, all built equally. Different instances of the same gate also can have different delays because of variation in the manufacturing. Uh, wires have non-zero delay. We ignored that, for example, over here. Uh, and we already said that. Temperature voltage affects circuit speeds, and it may actually affect the critical path, because not all circuit elements are affected the same way. So actually, the delay analysis is much worse in real life than what I just discussed. We're going to keep it simple, but it's much worse. Keep that in mind. So you need to, whenever you do delay analysis, you need to assume worst case conditions and run many simulations uh, to balance yield and performance. Uh, if you didn't understand that, that's okay. But worst case is important, basically. OK, so basically, uh, this is a summary of combinational timing, and we're going to build on this uh, soon. So, uh, what I said, the circuit outputs change sometime after the inputs change. This is caused by uh, the capacitance and resistance, as well as finite speed of light. And the delay is depend on inputs, environmental state, et cetera. We've seen two things, contamination delay, minimum possible delay, propagation delay, maximum possible delay. Keep that in mind. And we said that delays change with circuit design and operating conditions. Now let's, let's examine some issue that may or may not be important depending on the design you have. I, I said that I will talk about this later on uh, in an earlier lecture. And this is the idea of glitches. Uh, now glitch, what is a glitch? Glitch is when one input transition, uh, when in, one input transitions, you may actually have multiple output transitions. And one, one, uh, uh, the first transition may be short. It's a glitch. It really should not happen in a sense. But it's happening because of the timing variation that you have in the circuit, different timings you have in different paths. We will see that an example. So let's take a look at the circuit. It has three inputs, one output. And uh, let's assume that inputs are initially 0, 0, 1. Whenever you want to change this input to, uh, oh, OK, let's assume that uh, it goes from 1 to 0. Initially, it's 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. Uh, in, uh, OK, let me go back over here. OK. I have to run through it now. This is one, uh, this is one. OK, I think I understand it better. <laughs> Let me do it over here. So basically, uh, initially, uh, the, the inputs are, uh, uh, mm, let me see over here. So when you're, when you're changing uh, the uh, x from y, 1 to 0, y goes from 1 to 0, 1. Basically, OK, so that's, even I need to think about it a little bit. 
I thought I, I thought about it, but uh, so basically this is our inputs initially, zero, zero, uh, zero, zero, one. This should be one, right? But if you're going from one to zero in, the, in this particular input, what happens? Let's take a look. There are two different paths over here. Uh, there's a slow path that takes three gates, and there's a fast path that takes two gates over here. So uh, if this is zero, uh, one, one over here, what happens is your output will transition from one to zero first, and then go from zero to one. Because what happened over here is this fast path, uh, which basically changed this from one to zero, actually uh, caused a one to zero change. But then later, the slow path changed it back to one. Does that make sense? So you actually cause a small change because this fast path propagated this input very quickly over here. And that caused a glitch. This is called a glitch from one to zero. And then later, uh, this, this change got propagated through this path and led to a zero to one switch. Make sense? So basically, the fact that this output changed this input faster than, uh, sorry, this input changed uh, this particular path faster than it changed this particular path made it uh, cause this glitch in between. So let's take a look at this example over here. Uh, in this uh, timing diagram. We're changing B. Uh, B goes from one to zero. And we're gonna look at these two signals internally, N1 to N2. And it, N2 is going to change faster because there's only one gate over here. Whereas here, there's an uh, inverter and another gate there. So there are two gates. So N2 changes a little bit faster. The fact that N2 changes causes Y to change, transition from one to zero. As a result, you get a glitch. But later, the fact that B changed affects N1 but it takes a little bit longer. As a result, the fact that M1 changes over here leads to uh, the output changing back from zero to one. So that's the glitch. Unfortunately, you had this glitch that pulled you down for some time. Uh, the question is, is this important or not? Uh, whether or not this is important depends on how you do the timing, because what are you going to do with this output later on, right? If you're going to sample this output right here, too bad, you got the wrong value. So ideally, you don't want to do that. If you're going to sample the output over here, there's no problem, right? Because you got the right value. So it depends on how you do your timing. Uh, so how do you actually avoid these glitches? Uh, these, these are not necessarily bad, but this is something you should be aware of at the lowest level. Uh, so basically, actually, we saw, this is, a, this is a pretty cool method. Basically, we saw how to uh, minimize circuits using k-maps. We actually are going to use the same uh, k-map functionality to uh, avoid the glitches. So what's happening? K-maps actually show the results of a change in a single input. Uh, and a glitch occurs when you're moving between uh, the parts, uh, these prime implicants. If you remember prime implicants, these are, this is an implicant, and this is another implicant, and these implicants don't, don't overlap with each other. They have no uh, variable that overlaps. And if you actually form a circuit based on just prime implicants, you minimize the circuit. That was the idea with K-maps, if you remember. Now, what's happening over here is, if you look at this circuit, uh, this path is encoding BC. This path is encoding A bar, B bar. So A bar, B bar is this one. BC is this one. Uh, basically, when you're switching uh, B from one to zero, you're going from here to here. That's true for zero to one actually over here. Which means that uh, the glitch is happening because these two things are changing in a different way. So how do you actually form this? How do you actually fix this? basically by making your circuit larger. So how are we going to do that? Basically, you're you gonna add this, what is called this consensus term. Ignore the terminology maybe a little bit, but basically, we're gonna ensure that you never go from one prime implicant to another uh, without having a, some other implicant that's covering that part. So basically, we're gonna add this other gate over here, AC. This ensures that there's no transition between prime implicants because Actually, these implicants are not prime anymore. Well, these two implicants are prime with respect to each other, but you're never transitioning from this to this directly because there's a gate that's covering it. So what's that? Uh, basically, I added this A bar C. This is A bar C over here. I added this one over here. Now it's a bigger circuit, but whenever you're, uh, you're switching B from one to zero, there's no glitch because whenever B switches from one to zero, this, this one doesn't change. There's no dependence on B over here. As a result, there is no glitch. Does that make sense? So if you actually study this on your own, you will see that this is correct. I didn't do the logical analysis over here, but all of those are correct. And this is an example in your book also. Okay, any question?
this is pretty cool, I think. Basically, this, this, this basically shows that uh, the fact that things are close to each other also impl implies something about timing, which variables actually affect the, affect the output, even if you have some timing. Okay, basically, this is an interesting trade-off. You can actually fix the timing issues that you may potentially have by adding more area in this case. Okay, so I, I, I already said this, but do we always care about glitches? And the answer is actually no, uh, not necessarily. If you actually design your circuit timing nicely such that you never sample uh, outputs at the point where they might glitch, this is not a problem. Uh, and fixing them is undesirable uh, because it causes more chip area, more power consumption, more design effort, just like we did with the K-maps, right? We minimize our circuit and we don't want to minimize that anymore to fix the glitches. That sounds like a not, not, a, not a good idea. Uh, if the circuit is eventually guaranteed to converge uh, to the right value regardless of glitches or glitchiness, that's fine, and it's usually the case. Uh, so we basically, we don't always care about this. If we care about the long-term steady-state output and we don't sample, it, uh, sample the output at the wrong times, we can safely ignore the glitches. So basically, it's up to the designer in the end. Uh, but it, it also depends on the application. If you're going to sample the outputs very frequently, you may actually sample the glitches. And you don't want to do that. For example, you definitely don't want a glitch affecting your traffic light. If you remember the Swiss traffic light from yesterday, you don't want a glitch affecting your output such that it turns green for a while and then turns red again, right? That would be terrible. <laughs> but there are other ways of preventing it by actually making the timing longer to ensure that you never sample uh, the glitch, uh, the, the output whenever it glitches. Okay. But you need to be careful, basically. Okay, any questions? So, okay, let's, uh, if you want more information about this, your book actually covers this. Uh, so sequential circuit timing, let's take a look at this, because this is actually, now we're, we're going to look at a real circuit, because combinational is not enough. We, we really want to sample the outputs and inputs. So recall the D flip-flop, uh, you remember this, the flip-flop samples the D, uh, which is the input, at the clock edge, rising or falling clock edge, and it stores the sampled value until the next active clock edge. It's made from combinational elements that you've seen before. As a result, D, Q, and clock all have timing requirements. And I'm going to introduce some additional timing requirements over here. And these are called the setup and hold times. So basically, you have a clock. And if you remember, we want to actually sample uh, the inputs whenever the clock in the rising edge, in this case, goes from 0 to 1. To be able to do that correctly, you need to sa uh, satisfy two kinds of timings. One is the setup time, and the other is this hold time. And they're together called the aperture time. It's like the aperture of a camera. You need to keep the aperture long enough such that you can capture the photo in a nice way. Right? So basically, what is a setup time? Setup time means uh, you need to keep D stable for some time before the clock edge uh, uh, happens. Basically, uh, this, uh, for, for T setup, uh, the input D should be stable. If it changes at that point in time, you're not guaranteed to get the, uh, capture the value correctly. Okay? Simple. Hold time is exactly opposite on the other side of the clock. Basically, you need to keep D stable for some time after the clock changes from zero to one. Okay? That's the idea, basically. Basically, you need to keep D stable for some time until it gets latched. And it's governed by sometime before the clock edge happens and sometimes after the clock edge happens. And you need to obey both of them. And aperture time, we're not going to use aperture time, but it's, it's basically T setup plus T hold. The, you need to keep the data constant while the camera is open, basically. Okay. So I'll very briefly talk about metastability. I said that I was going to talk about it. That's why I'm talking about it. We're not going to cover it later on because it's a lower level issue also. Basically, if D is changing when it's sampled, if you don't obey these timings, metastability occurs. What happens is flip-flop output gets stuck somewhere between 1 and 0, and output eventually settles non-deterministically based on circuit characteristics. This could be based on variation, based on different things, which we're not going to get into. But I'll give you an example of this. This is the SR latch. Remember, this is exactly the reason why we cannot hold the inputs to the SR latch as 1-1. One, one. Uh, basically, in this case, uh, the clock changes, and if Q changes, if you don't keep uh, Q stable uh, enough time, you basically run into something that looks like this. Basically, these are different simulations for the RS latch, and sometimes it goes to one, sometimes it goes to zero, and it basically uh, switches between some values over here before it decides where to go, or before the variations in the circuit decides where to go. So this is based on real designs, real simulations. 
So you don't want this. That's exactly why we want to obey the setup and hold time violations. Uh, if you don't obey them, you'll get to some non-deterministic value based on the variation of the circuits. For example, which, which part of the D flip-flop is stronger versus not so strong, and you don't want that clearly, because you have no control over that. Uh, manufacturing process variation is something we cannot control today, uh, perfectly at least. Okay, so let's take a look at the output timing of the flip-flop. So uh, we have this Q now. Uh, we've seen the capture timing, which is T hold and T delay. Now we're gonna look at what happens from Q uh, uh, to uh, basically clock to Q. So there's a minimum timing over here. It's called clock to Q delay, or contamination delay for clock to Q. This is the earliest time after the clock edge, uh, the output Q of the flip-flop starts changing. It's very similar to the contamination delay we saw in the uh, combinational circuit, right? Basically, the minimum time between the inputs, in this case clock, because we handle the input D in some other way, because we want to keep it stable uh, around the clock. So the qu question over here is, uh, how, what is the delay between, uh, is after the clock edge uh, to when the Q starts changing? And the minimum delay is called TCCQ, contamination delay clock to Q. And the maximum delay is uh, the propagation delay from clock to Q, which is after late, this is the latest time after the clock edge that Q becomes stable, meaning Q stops changing, okay? So there is a maximum and minimum delay over here also for flip-flops that you need to be uh, aware of. Okay, we're gonna now look at some timing of sequential systems now that we have these. So this is a sequential system, right? Uh, you have a flip-flop that has the inputs, combination logic, and a flip-flop that captures the outputs. And your system overall consists of maybe another combination logic over here, another flip-flop, another combination logic, another flip-flop. So that's, it. that's basically the systems we have today. And we're gonna analyze one part over here. So we connect multiple flip-flops with combination logic, and the clock runs with a period, TC cycle time. For example, the Cabby Lake had, I don't know, four gigahertz clock period, right? I don't remember, maybe 3.9 gigahertz. So that's the cycle time that's determined uh, based on the maximum combination logic delay in any part of the chip. Now we are focusing on just one part that connects one flip-flop to another flip-flop. So basically we have a period, cycle time. We must meet the timing requirements for both R1 and R2 over here for this to operate correctly. And then we're gonna determine the cycle time. So how do we ensure correct sequential operation? Basically we need to ensure correct input timing on R2. What does that mean? The input to R2 is this D2 over here. I'm gonna call it D over here. Basically, this D2 must be stable at least T setup time before the clock edge, and at least uh, uh, T hold time after the clock edge. And we already said that. Basically, you need to ensure that uh, this D is stable for that. So how do we actually do that? This means that there is a, both a minimum delay and a maximum delay between the two flip-flops. That's where, this is where the minimum delay will be important. So let's take a look at uh, this uh, too fast, the minimum delay. So if the, if the combination logic, CL is combination logic, if this is too fast, what might happen uh, over here is uh, you may get a hold, T hold violation in R2. Why? Basically, uh, you have uh, this combination logic that, that is too fast. Uh, the combination logic settles too fast, such that uh, whenever the clock changes, it doesn't stay, it basically changes very quickly. It, it, it settles much faster than T hold. As a result, the D2 is not stable enough for longer than T hold, which means that you haven't satisfied the T hold requirements. So you shouldn't make this combination logic too fast, because if it's too fast, after the clock changes, it'll change too quickly, and then the result may not satisfy the hold, re hold time requirement of this. Make sense? So that's the idea. This combination logic should not be too fast to be, or it should not be faster than T hold which means that you need to ensure that. That sounds bad, right? Okay, so there is a potential R2T hold violation. Okay, if the combination logic is too slow and your clock cycle time is not enough, then this is what happens. Basically, you go through the combination logic and uh, this uh, Q, uh, clock to Q delay, as you can see, uh, propagation delay, changes too slowly. You violate your setup time because you don't have enough time in the clock cycle that's uh, greater than or equal to your setup time. That's the idea. And this is not good also. So you don't want your combination logic too slow, and you don't want your combination logic too fast. 
combina if the combination logic is too slow, you can always increase your clock cycle time, right? So you can fix that. But if the combination logic is too fast, you need to make it slower. Okay? You have a question or? Okay. Okay, so there is a potential R2 T setup violation also. So let's take a look at this, basically. So safe timing depends on the maximum delay from R1 to R2. Let's take a look at the setup time constraint, which means that the input to R2 must be stable at least T setup time before the clock edge. I already said that. Now we're going to look at this, which means that your clock cycle time should be greater than uh, this T propagation delay from clock to Q. See, over there. So it, this is the propagation delay from clock to Q for this uh, flip-flop. And then there's a propagation delay through the combination logic, TPD, which we saw before. And then there's a setup time where this output actually needs to be constant. It should not be changing. So basically, your clock time should be greater than the addition of all of those. Which means that you wasted some work in your clock cycle, right? TPCQ is really the delay it takes, propagation delay it takes uh, to, uh, from, uh, for this flip-flop output to stabilize, right? And T setup is time wasted because you're waiting for the output uh, to be stable so that it can be sampled uh, correctly by this R2. Really, the useful work, assuming that you've designed your circuit nicely, is this profit, is what's happening in the combination logic. So this is called the sequencing overhead. This is the amount of time wasted each cycle because of the timing requirements you have for the flip-flops. And this is always there. Because you need to latch the data, you need to correctly read the data from here, and you need to correctly latch the data into here. It just takes time. And you, you can consider that useless work. And it is useless work, actually. Whenever you reduce the clock cycle time, your useless work actually increases because these stay constant, and you're really reducing your useful work. So if you're operating at a much higher clock frequency, you're probably wasting a lot of your clock on the sequencing overhead. So keep that in mind. That's why we're not operating uh, processors at extremely high frequencies today. OK. So let's take a look at the setup time constraint uh, and design performance. So critical path, I, if I, uh, as I said earlier, it's the path with the longest propagation delay. Right? So overall design performance is determined by this critical path, as I said. It determines the minimum clock period or maximum operating frequency. If it's too long, the design will run slowly. If it's too short, each cycle will do very little useful work, which means that most of the cycle will be wasted in sequencing overhead. Basically, I said uh, what I said just now. Let's take a look at hold time constraint. I want to finish this before we take a break. This is actually interesting, uh, because this is something you don't normally expect, right? And people try to do a lot to uh, overcome this today in the design libraries. So safe timing de depends on the minimum delay from R1 to R2, right? So basically, this means that D2, the R2 input, must be stable for at least T hold after the clock edge. It must not change until T hold after the clock. So let's take a look at what that is. So this is the contamination delay, minimum delay, for the output uh, uh, of this flip-flop to start changing. So that's the minimum delay uh, for this uh, clock to Q1. Plus, the minimum delay through the circuit should be greater than your T hold time, right? Because that's uh, the combination of the minimum delay over here plus the minimum delay over the combination logic determines how fast uh, your output over here becomes stable. And this should be greater than your hold time so that you can capture, you can satisfy the hold time over here. That's the idea. Now, this, this is confusing. You can think of it the, uh, on the other flip-flop also. It's the same, basically. Which means that TCD, contamination delay of the combination logic, should be greater than T hold minus TCCQ. Assuming that these are constants, TCCQ is a property of the flip-flop, and T hold is also a property of the flip-flop, now your combination logic delay should be greater than some value. Right? That's the idea. So usually people try to design the flip-flop so that uh, this is equal to zero. You may not always have that. If this is equal to zero, that's great, right? Because you hopefully have some combination delay. So if a good flip-flop is a flip-flop that has this equal to zero, but you may actually encounter flip-flops where that's not the case, then you need to ensure that uh, this equation holds. Okay, and this also doesn't depend on the clock cycle time, meaning that you cannot fix this problem by changing your clock cycle time. You cannot make your clock cycle time larger and this problem magically gets fixed. No. Uh, so it's very hard to fix T-hold violations after manufacturing. You must modify circuits. Okay, so 
this is a good place actually to stop because I'm going to give you an example, uh, timing through the sequential circuit. Let's take a break this time for 10 minutes because I have a lot to cover. Uh, sorry, you can still decide to go to the climate thing, that's fine. <laughs> but I'll start after 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, let's get started. I promise that I will start at 10. I'm starting at 11. That could be my whole time delay. <laughs> while the inputs get settled. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, so very quickly, I will uh, uh, make another attempt at explaining T-hold better because I think this is a better way of it, uh, understanding it. So what's T-hold? Uh, T-hold is a time uh, for which you need to keep D2 constant after this clock uh, switches from zero to one. Now what is, what is a good way of thinking about it? A good way of thinking about it is let's assume D2 was constant for the setup time. It's good. Now you've clocked it. You got the clock. Ideally, you would like D2 to stay constant for the whole time, right? For this to be correct, because you haven't latched D2 yet. You, you, you satisfy the setup time constraint, which was fine, the way we discussed earlier. Setup time is fine. D2 was uh, constant for the setup time. And then the clock has happened. Now you're sampling. D2. Now D2 should stay constant for T hold amount of time. Okay, so what is D2 affected by? Whatever happened over here. The clock edge happened over here. The inputs changed over here. Now D2 should not change for T hold amount of time. But what are those, what is that change dependent on? It's dependent on how fast you can go from this clock to Q and how fast you can go from the, through this combination logic. So it's the contamination delay from clock to Q plus the combination logic, for that, should not change, for that amount of time, uh, you should not change uh, D2. And that's where this equation comes from. Basically, whenever the inputs change over here, D2 should remain stable for some time because you're still sampling D2 over here in the second uh, flip-flop. Make sense? That's why this is a sequential system. The inputs over here, uh, change what you're sampling over here, and you need to ensure that this D2 doesn't change. So this clock to Q time plus the contamination delay through the logic should be greater than T hold. And then we uh, got this equation. Your contamination delay of the combination logic should be greater than T hold minus T C T Q. And one of your colleagues said, okay, maybe flip-flop designers are good and they keep T hold minus T C C Q zero, but isn't that, isn't, isn't that bad? It could be good or bad, if T hold is very large, and if they actually uh, ensure that TCCQ is very large, that may be bad because they're increasing the delays now. But they may be able to design the flip flop such that uh, T hold is not that large, right? And this, this really depends on the integrity of uh, the design. Yes? Say it again? Huh? Yeah, that's the fastest time. Remember, CCQ is, uh, so maybe ignore the timing diagram. Basically, that's the fastest time when things start switching. Minimum time, right? And that's, uh, you need to satisfy the minimum time, not the maximum time here. Okay, it's very similar to the contamination delay that we saw before. Okay, okay, so now, now let's take a look at the sequential timing uh, summary. Basically, CCQ, if you look over here, that's the clock to Q delay contamination, PCQ is the propagation delay, that's the, when the Q becomes stable. Uh, CD is the combinational delay, uh, uh, it's not shown, oh, it's, it's over here, this is the CD. Basically combinational delay, minimum combinational delay through the combinational circuit, and PD is the maximum combinational delay, uh, which is over here. And you have the C setup and the T hold times and the clock period. Okay, now we're going to analyze, uh, do some timing analysis in a sequential circuit that looks like this. It's still simple. And I'm gonna make up these values. These are the timing characteristics. This is actually also in your book. Uh, CCQ is 30 picoseconds, PCQ is 50. Setup hold times are large in this case. And you have the gate per gate, uh, propagation delays and contamination delays. And as you expect, propagation delay should be larger than the contamination delay. And PCQ should be larger than the CCQ, as you can see. And there's no relationship between T setup and T hold. It really depends on the characteristics. So what you need to do in your timing analysis is you need to check, out, check the setup time constraints, which is the maximum clock cycle time or minimum clock cycle time you want to have. 
And you also need to check the hold time constraints. But first, let's take a look at the propagation delay across the circuit uh, in the combination logic. Basically, the maximum, uh, maximum delay goes to three gates. It's 105 picoseconds. It's basically three gate delays. And the minimum delay is essentially one gate delay. It's per gate, as you can see over here. It's 25 picoseconds. So maximum delay is 105, minimum delay is 25 picoseconds. So let's check the setup time constraints. Basically, what does that mean? Uh, the, the maximum delay uh, determines your clock cycle time. Max, what is maximum delay? The maximum delay from uh, um, the clock until the queue stops changing, P, TPCQ, 50 picoseconds, plus the maximum propagation delay through the combination logic, which we calculate as 105 picoseconds, plus the setup time, which is in total 215 picoseconds. So your clock cycle time should be greater than that, which means that your maximum frequency is one over that 4.65 gigahertz in this case. That's great. So we've, we've set up your clock cycle time this way. Normally you add some margin to it because what happens if, if your voltage changes, your, your voltage may fluctu fluctuate also, uh, also this may age. So normally people add margin uh, to this. So you actually add plus T margin and the T margin is determined based on experience and many other things. So normally you don't operate things at the very cutting edge over here. Okay, so we also need to check the whole time constraints. Basically the question is, does TCCQ plus TCD, as we've seen before, TCCQ is clock to Q delay minimum, TCD is the minimum combinational delay, 30 plus 25, is it greater than 70 picoseconds? 70 picoseconds happen to be the whole time. In this case, it's not. So this circuit fails the uh, whole time requirements. Uh, when this happens. Okay, so how do you fix it? So basically we're gonna fix the whole time violation by adding more gates. So if you actually add more gates over here, what, what, what you're doing is you're increasing the combinational delay, uh, mac, uh, minimum combinational delay through the combinational logic. Now let's do the analysis again. Minimum combinational delay TCD becomes 50 picoseconds. Maximum delay doesn't change because this is not the critical path and you didn't add anything to the critical path. That's good. Because your maximum combinational delay doesn't change, your clock frequency stays the same because um, this is all about the maximum delay, not the minimum delay. And now we actually satisfy, well, I already said that, we actually satisfy the whole time constraint because we added extra delay over here. Now the clock to Q delay minimum uh, is 30. But now the minimum combinational delay through the combinational logic is 50 because we have two gates over here. And 80 picoseconds is greater than the T hold time specified here. As a result, the circuit passes. The timing, that's great. But to be able to fix the hold time violation that you had, you added extra circuitry over here, which causes extra area, extra power. So if you could get away with flip-flops that do not impose you to do these things, that's much better. But in cutting edge designs, you may actually need to deal with whole time violations like this. Okay. Uh, okay, so there, <laughs> I'm gonna complicate things a little bit more. I said T margin, right? T margin is dependent on many things, but there's also another thing uh, that affects, uh, so we, we ignore T margin. What is T margin? Basically, life is not as beautiful because of aging, voltage variation. So actually, uh, one thing is uh, the voltage source is not stable over here, so it could actually vary meaning that voltage may change, fluctuate, while things are operating. So if you actually believe all of these, you may actually fail still if you clock at the max frequency. So you, people usually add margin. Or, of course, your aging also changes your voltage and the circuits. As a result, you add some T margin that's determined in actually very difficult ways. And we're not gonna cover that. What we're going to cover is something that's, that you may empathize with a little bit easier, which is called the clock skew. And this is really about the wire delay. So uh, essentially clocks have delay too. Uh, because clock is, you actually generate the clock with some sort of ring oscillator on the chip. And it needs to reach all parts of the circuit at the same time, right, uh, to, to work correctly. So a clock CQ is the time difference between two clock edges. So remember R1 and R2, uh, it's an example over here. Let's assume you have a clock source that's close to the clock source. So it sees the clock much faster. Let's assume this sees the clock much slower. Now there's a problem because the clock that sees is different from the clock it sees. There's some delay between them. Now where does this matter? We'll see that uh, in a little bit. So basically this is the clock skew is uh, the difference in when point A sees the clock versus point B sees the clock. 
So there's some delay. And this is a real processor from 1996 or so, Alpha 21 to 64. It was the fastest processor of its time, 500 megahertz. It doesn't exist right now, unfortunately. It's beautiful. Uh, and you can see uh, these folks who designed the processor showed uh, the skew, the delay of clock uh, from, uh, in different parts of the circuit. You can see that the delay can range from almost zero, it's not zero, but uh, to, I don't know, maybe 75 or 65 picoseconds. So there's a clear difference in, in terms of the time when the clock reaches uh, different parts. And if you see over here, there are peaks, like it's like mountains, four mountains. Why? Because they had an H tree type of clock tree. So they distribute the clock with a network, and the network looked like an H, essentially. And we will see some examples, but I'm not going to go through this in detail. So let's take a look at this realistic thing. Uh, and this is just one example of the realistic things that makes timing even worse. So safe timing now requires considering the worst case Q. So let's look at our simple example. Uh, let's look at the setup time, uh, revisit that. So let's assume that the clock arrives at R2 before R1. That's the worst case time uh, in this case. Because what happens is it leaves as little time as possible for the combination logic. Because if the clock arrives over here early, compared to here, you start sampling the output of this combination logic early, and this starts actually giving you results later. As a result, you have a problem, right? So basically, this looks like this. This is clock one. It starts switching later over here. Clock two starts sampling earlier, right? That's clock two over here. So there's some skew between them, which means that clock one, uh, the PCQ is from here to here. Uh, so basically, signal must arrive at D2 earlier. Uh, so let's, let's say, take a look at the do the timing analysis. This is your TPCQ, propagation delay uh, from a clock to Q, and then maximum propagation delay through the circuit, and then the setup time. Before, we were okay satisfying this, right? But now there's a skew, and things start later. As a result, we need to add the skew over here also. Basically, essentially, you increase your T setup time because the clock here arrived uh, later. What does that mean? Essentially, uh, your clock cycle time should be greater than what we said before, TPCQ plus TPD plus T setup, and the skew of the clock. Unfortunate, but you need to take into account the fact that you don't have in, uh, as much time, uh, as much clock cycle, because clock arrived a little bit later to this one. And this is our equation now. It's the T setup effective, which includes the skew. Okay, so whole time you do a similar analysis. In this case, safe timing requires considering the worst case Q. In this case, worst case Q means that clock arrives at R2 after R1. What does that mean? This, this effectively increases your hold time because whenever you're uh, thinking about the hold time, remember, you need to hold the inputs to this constant for some time. If the clock arrives here uh, later, then you need to hold this constant even more because you start sampling this later than you start switching this. Right. That's the idea over here. And basically, uh, you effectively increase your hold time also. TCD plus TCCQ now must be larger than T hold plus the skew because you need to keep the input over here constant for an additional amount of time. Uh, and that's your T hold effective. OK. So it's unfortunate, but these things exist. Skew effectively increases both the T setup and T hold, which makes your timings worse. Uh, and it also it increases sequencing overhead. Less useful work is done per cycle. And now you actually need to keep the hold time, uh, do more to keep the hold time constraint. And designers must keep skew to a minimum, basically. Uh, but this is also difficult. It requires an intelligent clock network ac across a chip. So how do you minimize the skew? Uh, so skew is effectively happening because clock doesn't arrive at the same time everywhere. Uh, basically, it's not synchronized, right? This clock may be, I don't know, uh, it's past 31, some other clock in some other place past 32, right? You're not synchronized as a result, you may you take different actions. So the goal is to have the clock arrive at locations at roughly the same time, and people do a lot of research in this. These are clock trees, different sort of clock trees from 2010 or so. I'm not going to go into detail, but uh, basically, uh, you have the clock source, and then you try to balance things across the circuit in different ways, such that clock arrives at all of the places at the same time. But even then, it's not easy because there is manufacturing variation that you cannot avoid uh, in these cases. Okay, 
Any questions? Now I'll give you an example of a realistic constraint that actually uh, makes life harder. Now imagine adding aging, voltage, dot, dot, dot. This actually becomes much harder. But now we're going to switch gears. We're going to talk about verification. And I'm going to switch gears to logical verification first. Basically, the key question over here is, how do you make sure your circuit works? Uh, basically, there are two aspects of this. One is, is it functionally correct, ignoring timing? Even if it's functionally or logically correct, functional and logical are the same meaning, uh, does the hardware meet all the timing constraints? So there are two aspects, functional verification and timing verification. Uh, yeah. So the answer is, how do you actually test for this? The answer is tools, actually not just simulation tools, but tools in general. One way of doing this is formally verifying that everything is correct logically uh, by proving things. And there are different kind of tools for that, which we're not going to go into here. It's very important to do it, but it's, it becomes much more difficult for circuits that are huge, like billions and billions of gates. Uh, and the other way we're going to uh, approach in this course is really doing uh, simulations uh, through the tools that you're going to use in your lab, not just timing, but timing plus functional simulation. Uh, there's also lower level simulations like circuits that we're not going to get into over here. Basically, we're going to use a lot of tools to be able to do that. Uh, but large designs are actually difficult to test uh, because uh, testing is actually one of the most con con time consuming stages. So if Intel designs a processor, for example, more than 60% of the time is test uh, spent actually on functional and timing verification and fixing the bugs and then uh, re-spinning re the circuit uh, out. So it takes a lot of time basically. Uh, so okay, uh, you need to ensure that functional correctness and timing and power, uh, actually we we're not gonna talk about power but there's also power aspects of this also. Uh, unfortunately, low level simulation is much slower than high level simulation. So we're gonna look at high level simulation uh, more. And we're going to split the responsibilities. So for example, we want to check functionality only at the high level. If it's possible, we would like to do it at even higher level, like C level, HDL level, but C level is usually not available to us, uh, or higher, higher level language level. Uh, because why, why do you want to do it at high level language? Because it, it enables fast simulation time. And this way you can test the circuit with many, many inputs. And you can easy, easily write and run tests. So this is very similar to software debugging. You've written your software, how do you ensure your software is correct? What do you do? I guess one thing you could do is formally verify it, but that's very difficult. The other way you do it is test with input test cases, right? That's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to give input test cases and check if our functionality meets what we expect for, uh, for the output uh, of the test cases and the timing after, afterwards. And if you do it at a higher level, it's much better. If you actually go through all the transistors, it's much slower, right? Okay. So, and then we check timing, power, and other things at the low level or more circuit level. Uh, we don't do functional testing at the lower level, uh, meaning uh, transistor level, let's say. Uh, uh, or, or even HDL level, you don't want to do necessarily functional. Uh, um, well, um, HDL level, you, you, you may, may or may not be able to do functional uh, timing and power analysis easily. Okay, but we're going to test functional equivalence to the high level model. I think we are, these, are, these are going to be more clear when I actually explain it uh, in detail. So basically, uh, timing and power test uh, uh, verification is hard, but it's easier to do, uh, 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 to do at this level, whereas functional uh, verification is easier to do at the higher level. Okay, we'll see some examples. So basically, we have tools to handle different levels of verification, and logic synthesis tool, for example, that you're going to use guarantees equivalence to a high-level logic and synthesized logic circuit level description. Timing verification tools check all circuit timings. And after that, you have design rule checks that ensure physical circuits are buildable. Basically, uh, once you actually have physical circuits, how should you place them with respect to each other such that you, could, uh, you can actually build it on a real uh, silicon wafer? So our job as a logic designer is definitely not the design rule checks, but it's uh, providing functional tests for logical correctness of the design and providing timing constraints, uh, like desired operating frequency. Okay, and tools or circuit engineers will decide if it can be built. And if you want to be a circuit engineer, you should take the lower level courses for sure. So let's talk about functional verification. Uh, so functional verification is che for checking the logical correctness or functional correctness of the design. We're, we're not going to check its physical circuit timing, we're gonna ignore it. We may implement simple checks uh, to catch obvious bugs, but we'll discuss timing verification later in this lecture. So there are two primary approaches to functional verification. One is simulation, uh, as I said, 
Uh, and the other is formal verification. We're going to ignore formal verification. It's important, but it requires a lot of background to understand. If you take a formal verification course, uh, there you can actually prove that circuits can be correct, but this actually becomes very difficult for very large circuits. Simulation is slow for very large circuits, but it's doable, depending on what you're simulating. And we will use Verilog for functional verification in this course. And I'm going to introduce things like test benches for functional testing. Have you already done this yet? Has anybody tried test benches? Not yet. Okay, that's good. So this is in uh, section, I think, 4.9 of, uh, or some, somewhere in section 4 uh, of your book, probably 4.9. So what is a test bench? So it's, again, similar to uh, software testing. Test bench is some testing, so, uh, testing uh, part that you attach to your code and basically test your code. It's a module. Uh, it's created specifically to test a design. So if you're doing software testing, you would do this also. And the tested design is called the device under test, or DUT. It's basically, it basically looks like this. This is our test bench. Uh, we generate some test patterns, which basically change the inputs. And then the circuit under test, or design under test, uh, reacts to the inputs by generating outputs. And then there's some output checking logic that is within the test bench checks whether the outputs are correct given the inputs, which means that somebody needs to specify uh, which inputs to generate and what should, the, what should the correct outputs be for those inputs, right, logically. Hopefully, at, if you have a higher level of abstraction, you should be able to generate these at much faster and then input them and then check the outputs. Okay, basically these inputs are called test patterns. These could be handcrafted values like if you're a designer who's designed a, a big circuit, you may know what the inputs and outputs should be, and then you handcraft them. Or you can automatically generate them, right? You can actually generate some sequential values or random values. Uh, the key is, of course, how do you actually sure that uh, this works for every single value? You may not be sure, right? Because every single value may take a lot of time to test, as we will see with a single adder later on. Okay, and the test band checks outputs of the dot design under test against the handcrafted values uh, uh, or a golden design that is known to be bug free. I'll give you that example also. So if you can somehow, so this may be at a very low level because you're going to implement it, but if you have another golden design over here that's at a very high abstraction level, uh, you may be able to give the same inputs to the golden design. Golden design gives the outputs and hopefully you verified your golden design much better because you're not implementing it in hardware. You're, it's, it's a much higher level model and then you check the outputs to the outputs of the golden design. I'll give you an example of that uh, later on. Okay, so test benches can be different things. It could be a hardware description level or very log code written to test other HDL modules. It could be a circuit schematic used to test other circuit designs. We're not going to do the circuit schematic. We're going to look at very log code. The test bench is not designed for hardware synthesis. The purpose is just for testing. We're just going to do logical functional verification, and we're going to run it in simulation only. Uh, and you're going to do this a lot, uh, like HDL simulator, uh, the, the Vivado simulator that you're using. Of course, at the low level, you can also do this with SPICE circuits. How many of you use SPICE? I don't expect anyone, but there's one, two. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> Hopefully, you're not going to use this for this course. Uh, that's a much lower level of abstraction. Uh, it's fun, but basically it simulates the circuits at the uh, circuit and transistor level. Uh, we're going to use Verilog. Okay, basically we're going to use simulation-only constructs. So, for example, we're going to be able to say, wait 10 nanoseconds and then change the inputs to this. Of course, we're going to assume ideal stuff, uh, like ideal voltage current source, and basically we're not, uh, this is not, uh, this cannot be built anyway, and the purpose is not building anyway. So, we're going to look at some test bench types, uh, and we're going to, uh, some of them are going to be easier. So, there's a simple test bench. We're going to generate the inputs and outputs manually, uh, and we're going to do the error checking manually, and this is going to be a pain. This is like debugging software just using uh, simple statements and checking every single time. Uh, there, we're going to then uh, look at a self-checking test bench where inputs and outputs are still manual, but the checking is automatic. And then hopefully, if you can do this, this is the best way, test bench is automatic, meaning inputs and outputs are generated automatically, and error checking is also done automatically. That way, uh, as long as you can do the testing a lot and have high coverage, that's great. Okay, so we're going to start with an example dot design under test and walk through different types of test benches. And we just made it up basically. B bar, C bar plus A, uh, B bar. Clearly, this is not minimal, right? Okay. Uh, okay, so it's a silly function. 
uh, it's implemented like this. And somehow you implement it at the lower level because you want exactly this to be implemented uh, in, in after the synthesis. You know how to implement it at a higher level, but I'm going to use that later on. <laughs> okay. So basically, let's look at some syntax. Uh, what, do you, what do you do in Verilog to run this uh, verification? So there's an initial statement that you can use, which is similar to the always block, but runs only when the simulation starts. So this is a queue to the simulator that says, oh, this is where you should start simulation. And then there's a begin and end, and we're going to populate that begin and end, end in different ways. So for example, you can set the value of reg A to zero, it's a blocking assignment, and then wait for 10 nanoseconds, and the simulator hopefully simulates what happens during those 10 nanoseconds, and the output changes. And then after that, uh, uh, you change A to 1. And hopefully with a simulator and with a waveform evaluator, you'll see that during these 10 nanoseconds, the output should be whatever your circuit should provide. And we will see that we'll, circuit will be over there somewhere in a soon. And then after 10 nanoseconds, uh, the, output, uh, the input changes again, and hopefully your circuit responds with some output in simulation. And then you can display uh, something, basically. So this is actually useful also, because now you can display the value of A, for example. Or you can display something that says, uh, not A, but the output, uh, value of the output, for example. If you're expecting some output, you can say the output is not equal to what I expect. Right. Okay, we'll see examples. So we'll start with a simple test bench. This is our silly function. So this is our test bench, basically. It's a module uh, where you instantiate the test bench. Uh, basically, these are manually assigned. I'm going to declare regs, A, B, C. I'm going to manually assign them. And then uh, this is a wire. We check the wire. So you can think of this as the output of silly function, and these are the inputs to the silly function. And we're going to assign these, and we're going to check this. So how do you do that? This is a simple test bench. Remember, everything is manual to begin with. So what we're going to do is, initially, uh, we're going to set A, B, C all to zeros. And we wait for 10 nanoseconds. During this 10 nanoseconds, silly function should output Y. Right, and then we can observe why. So if you're actually doing the simulation of this, you will see a waveform where the ABC is set to zero initially, and for 10 nanoseconds, they remain at zero, and then you can observe what the output Y is. And then you can check whether that output is correct or not. Right? And then after 10 nanoseconds, you set C to one. Now it's a different input, and you can observe Y. And then after 10 nanoseconds, you set B to one and C to zero, so you can keep doing that, basically. This is how you apply different inputs, right? And then you can observe the output. Sounds pretty boring, right? This is not what you want to... This is exactly uh, like debugging software uh, by putting the input values into your software one by one inside your program, right? It's exactly the same way. But this is, exactly, this is not how you want to test things in general. But this is also useful. This could be useful when you're starting, especially. You can look at these waveform diagrams. So this is an example of what I just showed you. It's not an exact example, but basically your inputs, uh, this is your clock, and then there, there, there's our inputs. You can observe the outputs from here. Okay, and you will do this uh, in, your, in your labs. So basically by changing the inputs, you'll observe the outputs. But the downside is uh, it's just a lot of stuff, right, to go through. And you need to manually check that the output is correct at all times. So every, N, uh, every 10, 10 nanoseconds, the, output change, uh, the input changes based on what we've written over here, and the output should change accordingly, and then you should make sure that the output is correct given that input. That's good. So that's why we're not going to spend a lot of time uh, at this point. But the pros is easy to design. You can easily test a few specific inputs, corner cases, but it's not scalable to many test cases. Clearly, you're not going to enumerate all the test cases one by one in your program. And clearly, you're not going to check uh, the output manually outside of the simulation. So one way of checking it by uh, doing debugging, uh, printf style debugging, right? Or you can inspect the waveform signals. So we're going to do better. Uh, we're going to design a self-checking test bench. So this is a more self-checking test bench. You still need to supply the inputs manually. So it's the same as what I described over, over here before. You still have the silly function. You apply the first input, wait for 10 nanoseconds, and then check whether the, uh, why, uh, mm, whether the output is as expected. If the output is not as expected, you say the input that you've tested failed. Right? And you can do this for the, the inputs that you find interesting. Now, this way, you don't need to observe a waveform. Basically, the program basically tells you, OK, I failed uh, the expected output uh, for this input. Makes sense, right? 
Okay. Any questions? So, okay. Basically, uh, this is also cumbersome, as you can see. It's still easy to design. You need to test a few specific inputs. Simulator will print whenever an error occurs. You don't need to go through the waveform and figure out uh, whether it's wrong. But it's still not scalable to millions of test cases. If your circuit has lots of inputs, in this case, the circuit has three inputs, right? Each input is one bit. It's not that hard to check the way we describe. But if your circuit has millions of inputs, well, that, that, there's a problem. And also, there's another issue over here, which is you can easily make an error in the hard-coded values, right? In the output values, or uh, hopefully not in the input values, but in the output values. Uh, basically, you can, you can make as many errors writing a test bench as actual code. So your actual code may be correct, your test bench may be wrong, and then there's a problem, right? Okay. So, and also, it's hard to debug whether there's an issue in the test bench or in the design under test. Okay, so with self-checking uh, test bench, we're gonna also introduce test vectors. So something that makes this easier a little bit is to write a test vector file. So this, you, this is a list of inputs and expected outputs. You can create these vectors manually or automatically uh, using an already verified simple golden model. And we're gonna talk about that golden model. In general, it's good to build golden models so that you can actually have uh, uh, correct outputs for given inputs. So basically, this is a format of a test vector file. You have uh, inputs 0, 0, 0, ranging from that to 1, 1, 1, and these are the expected outputs. Somehow you figure out those expected outputs and put them into the file. Now what you can do is, uh, you can be a little bit more intelligent in your test bench. What we're going to do is use a clock signal for assigning the inputs and reading the outputs. This clock signal has nothing to do with timing. Uh, it, it has not really much to do with the sequential logic over here. It's just to test the circuit, basically. Basically, the idea is you apply the input on the rising edge, and we check for outputs at the falling edge. You can actually check for it at any time over here, uh, because there's no timing that we're evaluating over here. This may be a bit confusing, but there's no timing. The goal is functional verification. Basically, the purpose of the clock signal is to simply separate inputs from outputs. Uh, basically, we apply the input over here, and we observe the input any time over here, and then we apply the next input over here. We observe the output over here, and then we apply the next input at the rising edge again. It allows us to observe the inputs outputs in waveform diagrams. It's not used for physical timing, as I said. And uh, we'll discuss timing verification later, but it's not going to be very satisfying because I'm going to not tell you a lot about timing verification because it's not the subject of this course also. Okay, so let's take a look at, but this is very important. You will need to do this in your designs, for example, when you uh, test your designs. Uh, so this is one example uh, of, we're gonna have test bench, uh, self-checking test bench. Uh, actually, the, your paper has an, ex, uh, your book has an example also, but I think these slides are easier to follow. So basically, uh, these are the values from the test vectors. You remember, test vectors are going to come, come from a file. We're gonna read in ABC and then ex expected Y output. And then the circuit will generate the Y output, and we're gonna check the expected Y output with the Y output for the given ABC. And these are the bookkeeping variables, which vector where we have, whether we have errors or not, and then we're able to test about 10,000 uh, test vectors, basically, with this. Okay, so let's take a look at how we do this. So basically, we generate a clock. This is a, this is a way of generating clock in uh, Verilog. It's very simple, actually. Uh, this is what you do. It's an always block, it always executes, no sensitivity list here. Uh, and the clock is one for five nanoseconds, and the clock is zero for the next five nanoseconds, and you keep repeating this. So basically, it's a 10 nanosecond period clock. Again, remember, the clock, the purpose of the clock is so that we can apply the inputs and then observe the outputs. The goal is not to build a sequential circuit over here. The goal is to test the circuit that we've designed. Okay, so uh, basically, how do you read the test vectors into an array? This is a bit boring, but uh, essentially, you read from a binary file, uh, that file, into this test vectors array uh, that we declared earlier. And then we initialize, this is the first vector we're going to test, errors are zero, and then initially, we reset the entire circuit. If there are flip-flops in the circuit, hopefully, they will get the reset signal, and they will reset for 27 nanoseconds, which is arbitrarily determined again. Again, we are not simulating timing over here. It's all logical. Uh, this timing may be confusing. This timing is just for us to observe the times in the simulation, right? Not to satisfy any timing constraints or anything. Also, you can use read MMH, which actually reads the test vector files written in hexadecimal. Okay, and this is how you actually apply a single test vector at the rise, uh, rising edge of the clock. It's very simple. Again, always at the positive edge of the clock, you do this. 
your set A, B, C, and Y expected uh, to that particular line in the text, test vector file with the vector number. So now we've captured the test vector, A, B, C, and Y expected. We apply it to the circuit, which is the silly circuit. So remember, uh, it's somewhere, okay, we'll, we'll do it in the next slide, sorry. Uh, now we've captured A, B, C, and we apply it from the positive edge of the clock, and we get Y expected uh, at the falling edge, and these are chosen by convention. You can actually use any part of the clock signal, and I wanted to keep uh, consistent with your textbook. Okay, so this is how the circuit checking happens, basically. Uh, at the negative edge of the clock, we test. So at the positive edge of the clock, ABC gets uh, the value of ABC from this test vector's uh, vector, and Y expected gets the value uh, of Y expected from this test vector. And they immediately get applied to the circuit. Okay, I need to go back, I think, uh, because the next one doesn't show. Yeah, this is our circuit. Basically, every positive edge of the clock, ABC gets set to something, and this should produce a Y, and we already captured Y expected here. Now we just need to compare Y expected to Y. That's all we need to do at this point, right? Okay, so this is what, this is the code that does that. Uh, now, of course, if we're not resetting, we do this. If Y is not equal to Y expected, then we display an error, or you do whatever you want over there, and you can, you can count the number of errors you get. You can do some bookkeeping, whatever you want, you can add a lot of stuff. And then you go to the next vector. You increment the array index to go to the next vector. Uh, and then the next, uh, at the positive edge of the clock, you will sample the next vector because you inc incremented uh, the vector num. Remember, this is, this is the vector num uh, that's used to sample uh, uh, to get uh, the next ABC, next test vector. Okay, now of course, if you reach the end of the file, which means that you've exhausted uh, the test vectors, you've reached that sentinel value, which contains four X's, then you complete the tests, right? And then you can end the simulation. So these are some constructs that you will need to end the simulation. Basically, initial starts the simulation, finish ends the simulation. Make sense? Hopefully this is simple. A lot simpler than the timing that we discussed earlier. Okay, so pros of this is this is nice because it's easy to design, still easy to test a few specific inputs. Simulator will print whenever an error occurs. No need to change the hard-coded values for different tests. So this is beautiful. You can actually, uh, you don't need to change the hard-coded values inside your program. You can change the test vectors file. Okay, so now this could be error-prone depending on the source of the test vectors. How do you generate the test vectors and how do you actually generate the outputs? That's important, we're gonna discuss that. Uh, it's more scalable, that's the good part, but you're still limited by reading a file, right? You may actually have many combinational paths to test then will fit in a file and, or, or memory that you read into. Uh, and also, actually, uh, it's a bit cumbersome to do all of this with, uh, through files. That's why we are moving to automatic test benches. But let me introduce the golden models, because you can actually use the golden model to generate the test vectors file also, uh, even if your uh, test bench is not fully automatic. Uh, basically, a golden model is a nice model that represents the ideal behavior of your uh, logic uh, design. Uh, so it might be, this must be developed explicitly, and it might be difficult to write, because uh, you've already written to the circuit at some level of abstraction. Now you need to actually raise the level of abstraction and specify your circuit there. You can do it in C, whatever, at higher level programming languages for sure. You can do it in Verilog as we will see in a little bit. So for our example circuit, this could be our golden model, right? Of course, this is, this is a silly function. Uh, essentially, the golden model is the behavioral version uh, of the structural Verilog that I showed you. So it's higher level, clearly, and it's easier to write in this case. Uh, and this golden model output should match the output of the silly function that I showed you earlier, right? And if you've written the golden model correctly, golden model is correct, but you may actually do wrong in the silly function because silly function is a much lower level, right? Okay, so this is simpler than our earlier gate level description, structural description. It's, uh, in this case, it's easier to design and understand, it's much easier to verify, right? Okay. So an automatic test bench, uh, what it does is it compares the output of the design under test to the output of the golden model, as I described to you earlier. And ideally, this is what you would like to do. You would like to have a golden model. But it may not be easy, as I said, right? So the challenge is you need to generate input to the designs in this case. And what do you generate over here? Do you do sequential values? Do you do random values? This is called functional testing. And uh, the fraction of inputs that you cover is called coverage of your test or test coverage. Uh, 
And usually, uh, whenever a processor comes out, for example, they do a lot of functional testing, and they're not able to cover all cases, all functional inputs. Because imagine you have um, uh, n inputs uh, over here, then you, do, you have two to the n possible input combinations, right? If n is 1,000, it's big. If n is 10,000, it's bigger. If n is a million, it's bigger. So it, 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 uh, this, there's actually a field that talks about testing that tries to minimize the test patterns, because not all test patterns are good. If you test one test pattern, uh, you observe some output. If you test another test pattern, you may observe uh, that test pattern may be redundant with that test, uh, with the previous test pattern, because it's not, it may not actually synthesize the circuit in, uh, in the way uh, that should be synthesized, because the circuit may not be minimal, right? Uh, or uh, the test pattern may not really uh, produce something useful uh, for the output, right? So you actually need to generate the test patterns nicely if you want to minimize your testing time. Okay, before we go into that, let's take a look at this. So basically, how do you actually write the automatic test bench? Basically, you instantiate the device under test, you instantiate the golden model. And then, this is the test pattern generated code that I wrote earlier. Assume that we do the test pattern generation exact, uh, in a similar, uh, in some way. Uh, this test pattern generates ABC, uh, and every positive clock edge, it changes ABC. And then you get Y dot and Y gold. And then you basically check whether y dot is equal to y gold. If not, you get an error, right? So the beauty over here is you don't provide a y expected with the test band generator. The test band generator can randomly pick ABC values over here, or it could sequentially pick something. If you're intelligent, it's good. If, if the design is, if the testing tester is intelligent, they would actually pick something uh, that's nice and that covers uh, the circuit better. Okay, so the beautiful, uh, beautiful thing about this is output checking is fully automated. You could even compare timing using a golden timing model. So this actually applies to timing also, but we didn't do that. It's highly scalable uh, because simulation time is more feasible uh, in this case, but uh, because you're not loading uh, vectors in this case. So simulation time reduces, but now you still need to simulate enough times, uh, enough patterns to get high coverage. So at least a higher coverage of the input space because of the scalability. And it has a better separation of roles. Uh, designers, uh, somebody can design the design under test, somebody else can design the golden model. Actually, this is how it works in general, because it's better to be independent. And the person, uh, these two people actually then merge the things together and check. Of course, golden model may have errors also. Ideally, you don't want to avoid errors in your golden model, right? So you need to test your golden model also. Okay. Uh, but the, uh, the good thing is the testing engineer can focus on important test cases instead of output checking. So the cause is always get creating a golden model may be very difficult. And coming up with good testing inputs may also be difficult. So let's take a look at this example to see the complexity of this. So how long does it take to test a 32-bit adder? I'm going to answer. Uh, so in such an adder, there are 64 inputs. 32 bits, one input, 32 bit another input, two, uh, 64 inputs. So how many possible inputs combinations do you have? Each of them can take a value of 0, 1. Anybody? 64 inputs, okay, <laughs> two to the 64, right? So if you test one input in one nanosecond, you can test uh, 10 to the nine inputs per second. One nanosecond may be too much. Uh, basically, you can test this many inputs per day or this many inputs per year. And as a result, assuming these calculations are correctly, meaning that this model is golden, <laughs> you still need 58 years to test all possible things. Doesn't sound good, right? So you don't want to test all possible inputs, especially when your inputs are huge. Okay, so brute force testing is not feasible for most circuits. You need to prune the overall testing space. You need to be intelligent about what you test. As a result, people have developed formal verification methods, but they're also difficult to scale up. Uh, so a lot of people focus on choosing important test cases. Okay, this input test case is very important because it uh, may lead to potential timing violations or potential bugs. And if you have actually a lot of experience designing adders, for example, you will be able to figure out those cases. But verification is clearly a very hard problem. Uh, it's, not, it's nowhere near solved yet and the complexity is increasing, so there needs to be a lot more work to be done on this one. And I haven't even talked about timing verification. Now I'm going to talk about it, but it's going to be a very superficial treatment because we're not going to treat it uh, as a verification problem, I'm just going to tell you what you may do at a as a logic designer. So basically, uh, high, you can use high-level simulation. You can model timing using statements in the dot. Uh, and uh, this is useful for hierarchical modeling. 
So you can insert delays into flip-flops, basic gates, memories, and high-level design now has some notion of timing. And you can actually check whether you satisfy the notions of timing that are imposed on you by the uh, libraries, for example. Basically, you can simulate the timing on your own. Uh, the downside is this is usually not as accurate as circuit timing because you're just assuming some things about the timing, right? Or whatever is given to you. So usually, uh, timing verification is done at the circuit level, which means that you need to first synthesize your design to actual circuits. Uh, and after that, the verification has very design flow specific. Basically, there are special tools for this, which we're not going to get into. If we go into the tools, that, then we'll be doing real timing verification at the circuit level, which is not the subject of the course. But you're going to use Xilinx Vivado, for example, at the lower levels, there are synopsis and cadences which are more accurate uh, because they actually deal with the layouts and the uh, circuits that are uh, generated. So the good news is try the tools that you're going to use will try to meet the timing for you, like the setup times, hold times, clock skews. Once you're done with the logical verification, you go into this. They usually provide a timing report or timing summary. They give you the worst case delay paths, maximum operation frequency, any timing errors that were found. They may not be as good because it's a complex problem, but especially with large circuits, they may not be able to give you the best maximum operating frequency. They may be able to find something that's lower than the best. Uh, they may also miss some errors. That's also possible, unfortunately, because now you're at the mercy of the tool, right? Uh, exactly, this is basically it. The tool can find a, uh, fail to find a solution, it could actually be more aggressive also. These are, uh, uh, it basically, it can result in setup time violation. Uh, so it, it could actually lead to too much logic on clock paths. So it could introduce excessive logic skew. And there could be issues with asynchronous logic also. But the, hopefully, the tool will provide helpful errors, like reports. It can enable you to start debugging. Okay. So how can we fix timing errors? Uh, Unfortunately, once you have timing errors, you need to fix them through a manual iterative process. Uh, you need to figure out where the problem is, uh, and this could be tedious. Uh, if you're operating at very high frequencies, you'll need to deal with this. You can try synthesis and ply center out with different options. If you uh, want to use a tool, different seeds, and manual provide hints to the place center out tool, you can deal with this later on. Basically, you can manually optimize the reported problem paths, simplify complicated logic. So these are actually good things that you can do in general. If you simplify the complicated logic, you split up the long combinational logic paths, that's good in general. So basically, you can f also you can fix hold time violations by adding more logic. If you get a hold time violation because of the tool, which you hopefully don't get, uh, then look at the minimum paths in your circuit and then add these buffers, for example, or add additional gates that don't change the logical output to uh, fix the whole time violation. So okay, uh, this is going to be uh, my last slide before the summary. So I think uh, I didn't cover timing in detail, but we did a lot of timing analysis, but we didn't do a timing verification, right? But there's some good things that you can follow in terms of timing. Uh, clock cycle time is determined by the maximum logic delay we can accommodate without violating timing constraints. So there are three good design principles which are going to come up later. Uh, one is critical path design. In general, you would like to minimize the maximum logic delay that you have. This, minimize, uh, this is minimizing the propagation delay, TPD, right, in your combinational logic. Ideally, you would like to minimize this as much as possible. Of course, this requires design effort. Uh, if, if your goal is maximum frequency, uh, this is the case. This maximizes performance. And the second principle is balanced design. You want to balance the maximum logic delays across different parts of a system. We, did, we looked at a single flip-flop pair, right? But there are many different pairs of flip-flops. If the propagation delay of one pair is much longer than the propagation delay of some other pair, now you're limited by that one pair, right? Your design may not be very balanced because what's happening is you have a bottleneck this flip -flop, uh, the, the delay from this flip-flop to this flip-flop is dominating everybody else because your clock cycle time is determined by this one. And you also minimize wasted time. Let me finish the slide and we'll be done. And the third principle is bread and butter design. Optimize for the common case, but make sure that the non-common case do not overwhelm the design. And you'll understand this much more when we talk about the microarchitecture design. Okay, now we're done. And have a good weekend. Uh, I'll see you next week.